Lord, who art here in thy presence, and we have come again to gather about thy word. And we have heard this morning, and we hear it continually, that this is the food which thou hast provided for us while we tarry here on the earth. Just a little while, thou hast provided for our welfare and well-being. And we want to be intelligent about it so that we may cooperate with thee and work with thee. Therefore, we ask you that as we sit in thy presence, you will rest us. It's tiresome to be here. It's warm. and Everybody would like to rest. But we have the meeting. And so we pray that if you're present with us to help us, we may listen and receive from thy hand our daily portion. Therefore, break the bread of life to us as thou seest we may need for Jesus' sake. Amen. This is just a delightful afternoon to rest. Nobody knows it better than I. Oh, wouldn't it be lovely just yank his fire out in his shirt and just rest. But you know, you can't do things like that. You have to go to the work, to the work. So I am uh, going to the work this afternoon with my sleeves rolled up. And you're very kind to let me be informal, but... Well, I'm informal, and my method of delivery is very informal. I have no special technique. You wouldn't know I'd ever had training in a college and a seminary besides. But that's so far back, I always think that's a little after the Civil War period or someplace when I lived there. I don't know how old I am anyway. And, and I've quite forgotten about it, so I don't bother with that. And you let me move along. And so this afternoon, I want to continue the thought which we've had since yesterday. Now, when we get into a field of this kind, we can't get out in a minute or an hour or a day. We're dealing with this question of the food adequate for the Christian and our process of development and growth, of being able to partake of it. Then also the gradation that is recognized in the Word of God, a gradation in the people who partake of the food and also in the food itself. We must keep that in mind so that we move with God and not just take things for granted because it's in the Bible and we go poking along on our own little way. Sometimes we wake up at the end of the way and find we're clean off the beam. Well, that doesn't help us. We must keep in line with what God is doing. Now, he tells us in the Word that we are all gravy. Now, a lot of people don't want me to teach along that line because they feel that they're saved, consecrated to the Lord, and receive the baptism of the Spirit. Let's build it up real tight and have all the gifts and three trances and six visions. By that time, you're completely finished. You know, by that time, you're almost hopeless to do anything with. <laughs> uh, if you don't believe that, let me ask you if you ever noticed something in the Word of God. I read to you this morning how God had placed in the church the um, preachers, prophets, the teachers, uh, and then he's placed in the church all of these instruments. He's called them gifts, their personality gifts. All right. Now, it only takes one evangelist out in the field to get a hold of a lost sheep and, and bring them in. Uh, 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 an evangelist. One evangelist can go out there and bring in the lost. Well, now let me tell you something. After you get that poor lost person in here and get him really good saved and filled with the Spirit and a few extra blessings on top of it, it takes five of the rest of the person to do anything with him after he's got a meal. Did you ever notice that? It's true. Because he said he had placed all those other gifts in the church, not in the world at all. The evangelist is the only one that has been placed in the world. All the other workers and all these gifts, he said, he had placed them in the church for the edification of the church, for the building up of the church, for the perfecting of the saints. All of that marvelous and glorious work is in the church by all these other instruments, and only one in a place. Well, I have found it out. You travel with me, and I'll show you some things that are really interesting. One of them is to get a man saved and baptized in the Spirit, and five men to do anything with him after you get him there. And that's true. It's true. It takes about five instruments in God's hand to do anything with a man after you've got him saved and filled with the Spirit. That's a very strange thing, but there it is. How I many you notice? Know he placed him in the church. He did not place these gifts in the world. 
he placed it in the church and specifically says it's for the edification of that church, it's the edification of that body, for its culture, its beauty, its growth. And it takes all of these instruments to work on. Well, I know that very well, having traveled around and visited assemblies and churches and places, I said it surely does. You see, the, the um, impact of light and light and truth is so terrific on some hearts and lives that it almost sets them beside themselves. They are so overwhelmed with the marvel and the wonder of the glory and oh, they get to, well, you can't do anything with them for quite a while. Their spirits are too agitated, they're too vibrant. It's really true, you, cannot, you can't do very much with them until some of that is exhausted and reduced so that it comes back to a normal swing, a normal poise of spirit, and takes some people a few years to, uh, to attain that. It actually does. Their temperament, their disposition, the way they react to truth is so terrific is that sometimes they swing off on a pendulum here and then they swing there. And how many ever saw, have seen an old clock go like that quite a bit, while before it maintains its uh, equilibrium? Well, that's like people are. So it says, I have put about five instruments in the church to take care of these swinging instruments. Well, we have to be encouraged in that to think he thinks enough of us to do it. So he said we're graded. He told us that. We've heard that this morning. We start as little babies. Nothing but little babies. Well, here one crying. Now, what, how much do you think that little baby knows about this world? Yeah, he says. <laughs> you hear it? He's telling you about how much he knows of this world. And yet, how many know he's a legitimate, good, lovely, proper, darling, sweet, grand baby, isn't he? Well, how much does he know? Well, keep your analogy. God is just like that in the things of God. When we are babes in Christ, he doesn't expect us to know what we should 30, 40, and 50 years later. He doesn't expect it. But he does expect the little babe to grow to come into its growth normally and naturally, passing through all the periods that we find in the development of a child. And he has something in the Word of God for every, every part of that. Every period in which you find yourself moving, he will have something in the Word of God of truth, which will help you, which will hold you, feed you, sustain you. When you're a babe, when you're a little child, when you're a growing child, your adolescent period of spiritual living. Think of the, the adolescent period of, of a Christian in his adolescence, spiritually speaking. How many can see him? Yes, you do. If you know anything about them. Or are they all just the nicest things that you ever did see in the world? No. <laughs> you, if, if you keep your eyes open, you'll see some, some differences. Then how many find them gradually moving out of that into a... a, a, a a steadier sense of maturity and understanding. And finally, they develop into fathers and mothers in Israel. Uh, develop into spiritual leaders. Someone who has lived long enough and understands the things of God enough to give advice and counsel and direction. You can't do that as a babe. You can't do that even as an adolescent. You can't do that even in your beginning of your maturity. You're only feeling your way. Uh, say, uh, here I am at this age, ready to be taken home, and I'm only beginning to commence to get ready to find out the first things of it. And I've been in it for years. Just, just finding out, and no one knows it better than I, touching these fringes of the reality of spiritual living, just the fringes, just little gleams, little glimpses of the things that God has for us. They belong to us. We are made for them. The whole structural law of your being and my being is so constructed and made in God's economy and thought that it will adapt itself freely to it if you could be exposed long enough. If in all sincerity you dare to expose yourself to it, you will find that there's something in you. God has already placed it there in this new creation, in this new order, which will flow to it. it, it how many know you, you even hunger for it? You, you, you will even hunger for it. 
I've had people to come and say, I've saved, baptized in the Spirit, and I've had all of that, Brother Flint, and I'm still more hungry now than I was when I got it. Now, what's the matter with me? Nothing. I said, you're coming along in quite a normal pattern. Quite a normal pattern. If your hunger has been satisfied, merely to receive a few interesting experiences which are God-given and helpful. If you are part there, there's not much hope of ever getting people on. No, there should be a restlessness in you lest you park on that. Don't park on that. Use it and go right along. Use it and go right along. Don't be afraid that if you go along, you won't get any more. You will get much more. You'll get much more, but you have to learn as a little child. In his contract, it's just the same. You watch a, a growing child, how, how often it is hard for him, even in the adolescence, to, to let up on some of his childhood capers. You know, he likes to get in the cupboard and the cookie jar like he did when he was six years old, here he's 18. Have you ever heard of people like that? For sure. There's little hangovers, you know, of the child still manifest when he's 18 and 20 and 21. If you don't believe it, watch people as we see them every day in these uh, newspaper accounts of this strange subnormal development of the life. People who have developed into men and women are quite intelligent. And emotionally, nothing but little children. You know, I don't you know. What's the matter with these people fighting quiet with each other and yamming and shooting and all? They're nothing but little children who have never learned control. They have never learned anything about their emotional life and what it meant. Never. It has just run wild with them. And so when they get to be 20, 30, 40, and 50 years old, emotionally, they are not matured at all. They are yet a little child manifesting little childish papers. People have it when they're grown. Only they don't get to exhibit it. You know when you're little children how you go, we yeah, at each other, yeah. Well, how many you know great big people do that inside, don't they smile? All the time, then they smile all the time, but they smile. <laughs> well, that's the way people are, sure. Only they have grown up long enough now to disguise and wear their masks. They have discovered that life has provided quite a basket full of masks which we may use occasionally, and sometimes we do. But what I'm getting at is this. There should be a normal development of your whole personality, your spirit, soul, and body, your whole being, every, every part of you, should come under the, under the tuition, under the teaching, under the tutelage of the Spirit of God, so that the, the whole being moves up under the power of truth, sloughing off and dropping off all of these entanglements, which impede the way and, and stifle the spirit. It should be taken care of. Now we're going to talk a little bit about this food question. Well, the Lord has told us that uh, the food is in three general classifications, such as milk, meat, and strong meat. In the Old Testament, we'll touch with that this afternoon. I want to tell you something about the manna and the corn, the old corn, and all the provision which we find in the Old Testament too. God is very keen on this question of diet. It isn't anything new. There are a lot of food faddists today and people who are interested in diet, but God was much more interested in diet than you think. He's been interested in diet a long, long, long time. It's nothing new. But I'm glad he's an authority on it, so we not be afraid. I'm not talking now about drinking lemon juice or something of that kind. I'm talking in spiritual terms. He's a great dietitian. He understands the mechanism of my spiritual being and the food which is necessary and adequate. And therefore, he says, that at times there's milk, meat, strong meat. Uh, to use an illustration, I want to go back to the Old Testament and use an illustration which is given to us by the, of the children of Israel in their pilgrimage from Egypt to Canaan land. And in that dramatic picture, historic, really, really historically enacted, dramatically so, true, but all the time that's going on, God is telling us something. Now how I know that is because of a scripture verse he opened up to me one time when I was reading over in uh, Corinthians, 
Paul was elaborating on the life of the children of Israel and their mission and their work, elaborating on that, and then he made this little remark as he was teaching. Now all these things, and he is rehearsing the dealings of God with the children of Israel. He has been dealing with that. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, or in another word could be used as types. And they are written for our entertainment? No. They are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Well, when I saw that, it, 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 it encouraged me very much because I had been detecting and sensing in all these historic pictures and dramas and conversations and types, I had been discovering some lovely, beautiful spiritual reality all hidden away underneath. And I thought, is it right that we should go in there and get that up out of its setting and pull it all apart and see the lovely spiritual food and blessing and illumination that's there? Is it right? And the Lord directed me to this. And he said, yes, here it is. All these things that have happened in that Old Testament, they are only types and pictures for our admonition. Why? Because the same dramatization is going on in your heart and in mine. If you've never found that you've had in Egypt, you've lost your geography book. How many have found you've had in Egypt? How many know that Egypt is very real? I was in Egypt last summer, but I have an Egypt that's continually around. My Egypt isn't on the, on the map. How many of you know that you have the children of Israel moving around in you? Have you ever heard this? Traffic? Yes. How many ever had to cross the Red Sea? How many ever found a Jordan? Why? Because all of those things are here pictured, just like a little drama, a picture, to tell us that all the time inside, in our spiritual life, the counterpart of it, the counterpart, the, the, the analogy is that we will have the same too. Uh, I hope sometime to speak again. I only spoke on once on the household of faith, but people were scared when I got up and told them, I said, how many of you know you have the home of Bethany in your heart today? Well, they thought I was sort of fanatical anyway. They thought, now what is he going to drag out? Well, I said, if you have lived long enough, you will find that you have a, the home of Bethany in your heart. You have Mary, you have Mary, you have Lazarus, you have Martha, you have the household, you have all of that. But some of you have never discovered them. You've never made friends with them. You don't know how to interpret them. Sometimes they have been bustling around in, in your experience and didn't know who they were about the word. They are, they are all here in the word, but they are all here in your spirit, too. And if we are quiet enough and walk along with God, He will talk to us some very marvelous and wonderful things hidden away under very prosaic, everyday, commonplace doing. And while we read, First thing you know, we, we, we deserve something of spiritual value in there. And God has given them. He says that is all given to us for our admonition. Well, then I want to ask, how, how, how often have I been admonished by reading this story, or this story, or that story? How, how, how much have I been admonished in my spiritual welfare by reading this or that? Well, it's all for us. It's all for us. Every bit of it. But you see... We're sort of stupid in our flesh. And that's why the Spirit has come. He has come, and when He has come, He will lead us into all truth. When is the last time the Holy Spirit has taken you to the hand gently and led you into the Word right through some story and given you a lovely opening of spiritual value, real, beautiful, wonderful, written? But that's His ministry. That's His ministry. When he comes, he will do that. Well, I might say, well, how long have you been baptized? Fourteen years. But how many openings have you? I don't know anything about that. I praise God. Well, I say praise God too. But you should keep open. Even the old, uh, he only leads you a little way. Let him open. And you know, it will be so refreshing. And I'll tell you something else. You will never forget a thing that the Holy Spirit has made real in your heart and life. You never will. Because it's a direct contact, a direct opening, a direct 
uh, revelation of light and truth. And if the Holy Spirit can get you still enough and open enough to give you one, how many know it's so choice, it's so sweet? Oh, yes. I can remember in my beginning when God began to illuminate the word to me, my first little findings. Oh, I thought they were so marvelous. I thought, oh, what is that wonderful? That's been in the Bible all this time and I never knew it. Well, I want to say there are 10,000 more things here. If you stand still, maybe you'll see two of them. <laughs> Thousands of them. So they are for our admonition. Therefore, when I look at the children of Israel, uh, in just this one aspect, concerning their diet and uh, their eating, as we're dealing with this morning's thought of eating, 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 diet, when I look at them, I come into quite a revelation of, of truth. And I find that it's the parallel of my own heart and life and yours too. Now to begin with, we'll take the children of Israel, I like to start with them down in Egypt, because they're going to have a, a long sojourn. Uh, I wonder, I suppose, when I talk over here, you can't hear me. That's going to be very bad. Can you hear me now? Huh? Uh, be honest about it, because if I stand here and talk, I, I want to just do something here with this blackboard to help it. There's nothing picturesque about it. I'm an artist, but I'm not showing any kind of art effect here. When I come up to my home, I'll show you the truth. But then, um, not here. But I, I, I took this for the sense of um, uh, the, the general pattern for Israel. We'll call this Egypt out here. And here we find the children of Israel are in bondage. But you see, the children of Israel were not brought forth. God didn't call them and say, your destiny is Egypt. He called them that they might come way up here in Beulah land. Now that, that's their destiny. That's where he's going to take them. But he finds them in this darkness down here in Egypt in great bondage. And so we're going to have a, a kind of trip. We're going to take them out of Egypt over here into the wilderness, and then finally we're going to get over Jordan, that they have the Red Sea. It's real geography. How many know you got all this geography in you? Yes, you have. You've got all this geography in you, and I want you to be able to recognize it. So when God begins to work for you, you say, oh, that's Egypt. And then you say, thank you, Lord, and you know just exactly what it is, because that's way he will do it. So back here, we'll begin down you use your imagination here. I'm right here. This is Egypt, as you can see on the other side. But well, here we have the children of Israel in bondage. Now let's remember something. There's always a destiny, and there's always an objective. Now with the children of Israel, God has called them, and he has promised them something. He has promised that through them he will bring Jesus Christ the Redeemer of the world. But in the meantime, he's going to do some wonderful uh, maneuvering with them in their historic moving because it's all going to be a picture lesson, a picture lesson for spiritual teaching. So he says, this is not your real hope. This is where you belong. I will make you to, to live and die in Egypt. I have, I have brought you thus far and I'm going to bring you way up here. Your land is the land that I have promised you. Now, I've given it to you. I'll promise it to you. But I'm not going to say, come out of Egypt. One, two, three. Do it. Well, that's the way people are. That's the way you pray. Lord, right now, we're here. Well, Lord, I'm with you. Three days. Well, wait three centuries, dear. Not three days. So he doesn't say immediately, I'm going to take you into Beulah land. Well, then these uh, people who have such an extravagant idea of faith, they always disturb me because they're so funny. They always say, well, isn't God able to do all things? Where is your faith, brother? Here's the promise. Ask what you will and shall be done. God is able. And then they come flashing at me and pounding at me. God is able to share with me. I say, I know he's able, but get me in line with the able. I'm not talking about what If they never knew, they always tell me what he's able over here. How many ever heard that? Oh, I've heard some preachers in the van who ran up and down the path going, He is able! He is able! God is able! And everybody goes, He is able! But they never get you through. Well, how do you know he's able? How many want me to jump around here and holler and yell and slash around and say, Well, how many know it already? Seven of you. 
and, and uh, treasured along by the philosophy and teaching that the world has to offer. And the world is a doomed, judged thing. Dead. It cannot produce light. It cannot produce anything that will bring the truth to them to So we are in Egypt. Now that, that is where these children of Israel are. That's where people are in the flesh today, born in this world. They are born naturally in an Egypt. They're born there. No need to cry about it, because we were all born. How many know we were all born jailbirds? Didn't you know that? Yes, we were. We were all born jailbirds. That's the only thing. In prison houses. And the evil will come and set the captives free. They don't want to be your jail and mine. Let's stop it. But the natural man, he's nothing but a jailbird. Shut up in a jail. And he calls it that. And here they are. Now, all the while they're partaking of the Egyptian diet, it holds them under the government and power of that. The impact of that keeps them there. But that is not their destiny. They're not made for that. You and I were not born into this world to live in the world under the power of its limitation. Man is not to live by bread alone, but what? By every word that proceeded. How many see spiritual adjustment first? We were made for that. We were not made to live in the world, governed by the world, do the best you can, hope I'll get to heaven, and cry a little, lay some noise about That's a hard No, that's a hard He says, you have been born and brought forth in your prison house in Egypt, in a land of darkness, in this world. Its whole philosophy is wrong. All offenses for reason are wrong. They're lost in the, in the corrupt intellectual grasp that humanity had. Our best philosophers that we've had, Plato and Aristotle and Aristotle, all those. Every one of them, how many see? The roots of all their thinking are from the earth. The roots for their thinking are from the earth. But the earth is cursed. How can a cursed thing give life? It can. How can a cursed thing give life and truth and wisdom direction? It can. So it says, don't get under the power of it. Now another thing that he's told us not to do is to try to reform this old world and make it a lovely place for the Lord to come to for a millennium. I mean, a lot of people are off on that thing. Put up your hands if you know that. Well, I wish I had some church history with you. You need some good teaching, dear, dear, dear. I wish I could have you about a month with just some simple teaching of this thing. How do you know the difference between pre-millennial and post-millennial teaching? How do you know the difference between that? Well, that's good. That gives you a little wedge in. Uh, uh, the post millennial people, our churches are full. Our colleges, our universities, our seminaries, they're full. What is it? A teaching and a philosophy that the Christian impact of truth has been brought by Jesus Christ. Now the church is to take that up and convert the world and bring the world to some kind of order so that Jesus could come and reign. How do you know that old philosophy? Why, there's nothing in the Word that teaches that at all, not a glimmer of it. 